Hello everyone and welcome. I am so excited for today's topic. We are talking about reframing our diagnoses to achieve ultimate wellness. So if you have been suffering from chronic symptoms related to a chronic illness and your practitioner hasn't given you a whole lot of hope, this episode is for you. So to talk about this today, we have with us a good buddy of mine, Jonathan Parr. He is a chronic illness expert and physical therapist. So Jonathan graduated from Texas State University with a bachelor's in athletic training in 2006. He began working as an exercise physiologist for cardiac and metabolic conditions, while also working as a strength and conditioning training high school, collegiate, and professional athletes. Jonathan graduated with a master's in physical therapy from the University of Texas Medical Branch. The next 12 years consisted of working on traumatic injuries and some of the rarest disorders worldwide. Additionally, he's currently one of a few rehabilitation clinicians nationwide who currently specializes in the treatment of EDS and dysautonomia using the three systems approach. Many of you might also know Jonathan by his nickname, The Flying Squirrel, from the hit TV show American Ninja, Ninja Warrior, or ANW. So, American Ninja Warrior Obstacle Course is considered the most difficult in the world. And he was honored to be able to complete six seasons. So, if you want to check that out, he's on seasons five through 10. So, Jonathan, thank you so much for being here with Kate and I today. Thank you. I'm excited. Oh my gosh, the flying squirrel. I love that, Jonathan. I'm so excited to meet you today. I've been hearing so much about you from Lindsay, and I just can't wait to hear more about your story and how you're you're helping people do and heal from incredibly rare conditions. And so I know you've spent years um, helping people that have been diagnosed with something chronic and really to help empower them to get their lives back. And so I think we just would love to start off by hearing a little bit more about your personal story and your journey to get to where you are today. Maybe some of those pivotal moments that were catalysts to bring you to the work you're doing specifically when this, with, within this niche um, of physical therapy. So yeah, if you can just give us a little bit of insight into how you got here. Yeah. So it, you know, I, I always start with the same story with, um, kind of how everything got in and it doesn't change as much, but, um, my, it started back in like 2000. Yeah. The year year 2000, I was a sophomore in high school and my sister who was older than me, she's about five years older than me, uh, was gone, um, in New York and Florida and all this stuff for, for school. And what it was is that she ended up essentially waking up one morning, basically paralyzed on one side of the body. And, Me growing up, I didn't really know too much. I all I was into sports. I didn't know much about, you know, illnesses and um, traumatic injuries, those kind of things. So when I heard about it, I was like, okay, there's something that's she'll probably get over this like in a month, right? Well, as I started learning more about it, um, I learned that it was much worse than what I originally had thought. And so seeing her process and her journey, basically from that point, because she was only 21 years old. So when all this happened. Um, they couldn't figure out really what was going on. She went to multiple doctors, you know, they had different ideas of what it was, but it wasn't. And so that complexity of what she had, it took a while for her to get to the right people. And then ultimately she ended up getting to the right person from, you know, the right neurologist and the right, uh, physical therapist and just watching her journey, uh, towards recovery, which is pretty impressive given that. You know, she couldn't speak, she couldn't swallow. It's like presented like a stroke um, to where now she's up and walking. She has, you know, a family and um, she's at the point that, you know, the average person wouldn't be able to see that anything's even wrong. Um, So because of that journey um, and seeing all the places and the people that she went to that she 
they essentially couldn't really figure out what was going on. It made me think more about, okay, well, what do I want to do? So my initial thought was to go into those kind of conditions, like uh, brain injury, head trauma type of stuff. And it just so happened after a year of, of doing work, I got introduced to EDS and I had no idea what it was. I'm like, okay, this is really crazy. I have no experience in this, but it was very intriguing because it was very complex. And as I started to see more, it actually reminded me of very similar things that my sister went through um, based on what I was told and based on the things that I, that I saw, um, you know, unfortunately with certain, uh, you know, chronic illnesses, people think that it's all psychological. Um, people don't understand it. So they start labeling these diagnoses that aren't actually accurate of what actually the person has, um, which it was actually in the case of my sister, they originally diagnosed her with MS, but it ended up being something completely different um, that they re-diagnosed 12 years later. Um, so yeah, so actually seeing that it, it really hit hard with me and it, it really drove me, even though it wasn't the exact population that would necessarily fit with my sister, it was another grouping of individuals that needed that kind of care. And I just devoted really my time to really focus on that, um, that niche of chronic illness, because there aren't a lot of people that fully understand it. Um, both from physician and especially physical therapists, you know, none of these things are ever taught in school. And, you know, my personality is always up above trying to, you know, trying to one up everyone. It's just, it's just a competitive nature that I have, even from my, my athletic background, but I use it as a positive way to really affect a, a, a very specific population. Yeah, that's amazing that, you know, you saw that need from your sister and you were able to kind of form a career based on that experience. So you mentioned EDS and for those of our listeners who don't know what that is, can you define what that is? I know this is a specialty that you work in with, you know, a lot of people who've been diagnosed with EDS. So can you just tell us what it is uh, and how you work with that population? And then I want to get into kind of how we're not necessarily defined by that label, that diagnosis, but I think it's important context for people listening. Yeah, so EDS stands for Ehlers Danlos Syndrome, and it is a genetic connective tissue disorder um, that essentially affects the entire body. I mean, there's 13 different types. Um, within those types, you have some that are more severe than others, and then you have like standard hypermobility syndrome. Essentially, what that is is that you know, let's just use Cirque du Soleil, uh, the people that you see where they're super flexible, they're super mobile, it kind of falls in the realm of what EDS is. Um, but there's a lot of internal things that are going on. They could, since it is connective tissue, it does affect the brain, it affects the organs, it affects the muscles. And so it's, you have to consider it, the, the whole body because you're not really sure where to start and then they'll have a lot of secondary issues too so it's not just the one thing usually because of eds you have two or three different secondary diagnoses that are also causing more of the issues so it's it's a very complex condition but um under the understanding of the different types and different presentations make it a little bit easier to work with and unfortunately even physicians um or just the medical world hasn't done a ton of research to fully understand this condition yeah. And, and I know a lot of people gravitate towards your work who have EDS. I know you and I have worked together, you know, in groups of people who are diagnosed with EDS because you have a different approach, right? Because you have this more holistic approach looking at not just the physical body, right? Not just the 13 different types, but the person and how that healing process looks for them. So, you know, knowing you, knowing what you do, I know part of your mission as a practitioner is to really help people reframe the way that they look at their diagnosis. And you focus more on that holistic health and healing rather than simply giving people that diagnosis, you know, saying, mm -hmm. okay, you have EDS and giving them a prognosis that they have to stick to. So tell us a little bit more about how you do that. And I know we also talked about that three-step approach. So if you mm -hmm. want to kind of bring that up as well, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, you know, I, I think 
for most people, once they get a diagnosis, it's very traumatic. Um, because not that label holds a lot of weight, um, especially when it's when people are confused as to why they feel certain ways. Um, it's 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 complicated because you might get miss you know um, information that might be different from other physicians because most people they see multiple physicians, so it's hard to get in. So I know just starting off at that point, by the time they see me, they've already had a lot of trauma. I would say psychologically, because there's so much that's gone on, both from what they feel, from what they've heard. And then even once they're labeled, they, they look it up. And since there's not a ton of research on it, the basic information doesn't look great. And so they're directed towards, okay, this is really what my whole life is going to be. Um, without actually understanding the, the movement and the way the brain works and how the body heals. And in, I guess, in, in my approach of the three systems approach, we, you know, someone can come in with the label. And for the most part, I'm not really concerned with that label because I look at the body, the movement, you know, how are you presenting yourself as soon as you come in? Do you look anxious or is there any, um, you know, biomechanical faults? It's like, what picture do I get the minute you come in allows me a better starting point on where I need to start, whether I need to get more trust. Um, and typically that's, usually where it starts. It's, they've already been through 10, 15 physicians and therapists and done things the wrong way and gotten injured. So now their perception of physical therapy is now dramatic because now they're scared to get hurt. They have the label. Now they like associate hurt label, no progress. Like this is kind of like the, the spiral or the snowball that you get into. So when they do come see me, it's, a lot of it is more education on this doesn't define you because it, the connective tissue component, yes, is, is structural, but how your brain heals and how your brain uh, communicates to the rest of the body um, is not determined by your connective tissue disorder. Because I mean, your brain is your brain, it, the, the nerves are the nerves. And so we have to find the right way to give you the right stimulus to get these things to work together. Because in most cases, people that have this diagnosis were fairly active beforehand. You know, they played sports or they were cheerleaders or they used to run and then all of a sudden they get hit with the diagnosis or let's just say there's an episode and then they get hit with the diagnosis and now that feels like the whole world is crashing down. So how we look at it is we look at the autonomic system, like what are your stress responses? And that's not something that's taught for physical therapy, but it's a huge component because, you know, if they don't trust you, if they're anxious, what is that going to do? you know, for the hormones in the body, you know, whether it's dumping too much cortisol or too much sympathetic response and it causes you to fatigue. And so we have to consider that before we even think about giving them a program, because if they can't regulate their autonomic nervous system correctly, it's hard for them to even progress with movement and feeling stronger and feeling like they can do more. So that's where we come in and we're able to break that down. Okay. What, what's going on with your autonomic nervous system? What's going on with actual like GI? So we look at the more of the GI track, like how are things working? Are you having issues with absorbing things? Are you having issues with constipation? You know, whatever that entails in that bloating it could be something that may seem very basic. And then we look at the inner ear, which your vestibular system essentially gives you your like spatial awareness. It's like where you're in space and it communicates with your eyes and your brain. And there's a lot of that that is your foundation fundamentally just for life. Um, I tell people all the time when, you know, when they're driving and they look outside the, you know, for their, uh, about to change lanes and they accidentally swerve into the lane the minute they turn their head. Well, that's actually a lack of coordination between the eyes and the head because I should be able to turn without my body feeling like I'm going to move into the next lane. So how this relates to injuries or chronic illness is there's sometimes when people call your name, you turn and you slip off the edge and, you know, sprain your ankle. Or it could be um, where at night you're walking and then something happens to where you trip over something because you don't have that awareness. Well, this is all compiled into what your inner ear is telling the rest of your body. Now, chaining that to the autonomic part, if your spatial awareness is off, your autonomic system is going to try to work an overdrive to protect itself from anything that could happen, you know, whether it's... Um, something physical or, or, or something emotional, like there, there's all that that's there from that stress response 
that correlates. And so prior to going into more of the movements, as we understand that, then we now connect movement to those systems. And that's how everything kind of compiles, compiles together as a way to start that or initiate that, that recovery process. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. And, and before we kind of move on with, you know, talking more about the, um, you know, how athletes kind of use this information and talk more about that subject with EDS in particular, I want to hear from you. Have you seen people get better? Have you seen a positive progress? Have you seen a shift in mm-hmm. how people with that diagnosis actually feel? I have. So I've been I've been working uh, with EDS for 12 years now. So I've seen the evolution of how outcomes have, have gone over the past 12 years. And it's only getting better and better as, you know, we learn more about the body, right? But, you know... I think in, in, in the world that we're in, we all want quick fixes and it doesn't necessarily work like that. And so I think that's another part that gives you anxiety. It's like, I need this to be done. I need this to be done. But if you've had this for 10 years, can't really expect four weeks for it to go away. So a lot of that too is educating them like, hey, we're going to give you the baby steps and see the small goals and see these small achievements as a way for you to understand your body is making changes without overstressing in most cases that would happen if you were to try to go full force into, um, you know, chronic illness, and then you're trying to run a marathon, but we're trying to do the baby steps in between. And so that's where I feel like we've made the most progress because for most people, all you have to do is get past the first six weeks. After six weeks, you see how the brain changes, you know, with new information, it takes the brain about 10 to 14 days to really latch on just to the concepts. So it's not even saying that you're going to do things correctly. Like you're introducing new stimulus to the brain. Your brain's trying to rewire all the old bad stuff that it used to do to try to understand some of the new stuff without spiking or, or causing like a fight or flight response. And then once you're there, as you're going through the movements, then the person themselves become aware of their own body. And I think that's in most cases, whether it's EDS or athletes, is we don't really have a true sense of our own awareness in our body as we move, as we breathe, as we, you know, see things in the environment. Like how, what responses are are we really getting on a day to day basis? And that first six weeks is full of education, and it's full of uh, new movements, and it's full of um, the processing of compensation and, and how most people like your body will protect itself by compensating to some degree. So how do we change those patterns? And that's been the biggest part of the success with, with EDS is because we're giving them so much more awareness and it's so new to them that they have the idea of, of, they understand more of what their body is. And so they're less stressed. They're less um, likely to have some sort of injury. And so once they see that, then they build the confidence and once you get the confidence, it's it's pretty much, you know, smooth sailing from there, but you have to break that point. And, and I feel like that's what's different with what we've been doing over the past 12 years is we get people confident and we they see the changes and then they apply these simple fundamentals to life. And, you know, I've seen people go from wheelchair to kickboxing and it wasn't, that process didn't take six weeks, but over the course of time, they saw themselves, you know, improving, improving. So they were even more excited to invest more time in their own health because they saw the benefits. They, they saw that all the things that were said to them before about their diagnosis is actually not accurate. They're, the physiological component is, but the actual functional outcomes is, it's not. And so then you put that person in a group, in a support group, and that person talks to another person and to another person. And so a lot of what we've had, even at our facility, has been basically these individuals are actually helping other individuals. It's not even just us, but they're spreading the word about their success stories. And so that's where I feel like the big movement now has been, they do see change. They do see that life is possible, um, even even with with, with family, because you still have the likelihood that you could pass that on um, to another family member. But they're so educated now, and they have the support system of, their friends and even their spouses that it's changed the way people look at things and they don't now associate themselves with, Oh, well I have EDS. Like they just say, 
for the most part, like I have a chronic illness, I've done great. Uh, I've been able to manage it. So I I've seen people talk less about the label and the title of their diagnosis more so now than I've ever seen it. And I think they're able to help other people kind of detach themselves from the diagnosis and understand it's just something in my body that needs to change. And I have to work for it, even not just now, but just long-term. It's just a, a lifestyle now, not just going to rehab, which is, unfortunately, that's what's given to people is they have to do therapy for the rest of their life. No, they just have to live a life of wellness. Wow, Jonathan. I oh, There's so many golden nuggets in there. I think for me, my brain always zooms out to like the bigger picture. And what kept coming up for me as you were sharing all of that is, well, a few things is, you know, one, just the how important presence is in just taking time to observe the, the whole human being, right? Like in your practice, you said, when someone comes in, I just observe, like, how are, how are they energetically? And then to be able to treat and support people from that whole person approach, you know, physically, mm-hmm. mentally, emotionally, energetically, because they are all so connected. And then I love what you said around, you know, this mindset shift away from the quick fix mentality. You know, I went through um, some chronic things a few years ago and while our society in so many ways kind of programs and trains us to want those quick fixes, um, if I really was honest with myself and I took a step back, it was years and years and years of lifestyle and things that I was whether consciously or unconsciously choosing that were contributing to the buildup in my nervous system and the disconnection that occurred that kind of eventually the straw that broke the camel's back one day, right. That triggered for me, it was a panic attack, which, you know, trickled into many other things that I was experiencing. Um, So I think it's important for people just to have that perspective of like, maybe it, it, in some cases, maybe it was an event or something, a trauma something that was kind of more acute that caused the chronic um, Mm -hmm. symptoms on the back end. But in a lot of cases, it's right. It's these things that we're doing that can potentially um, build up over time. And then when we can take that empowered, we're in the driver's seat of our health, of our choices, of our daily actions, of our mindset, our perspective, then yes, over time, while it's not going to be an overnight thing, we can see these really small shifts that eventually build to that bigger transformation. Like you said, wheelchair to kickboxing, which is just so, so inspiring. Um, And really giving our brains evidence, right? That it's possible. I love that you mentioned the group support and just literally hearing other people's stories. There is nothing more empowering than to hear someone that's moving through something similar or the same thing. And you're hearing of the success and progress they're having. Like that is just the best feeling in the world. And so I can imagine how traumatic it can feel for people who are used to being so active, like you mentioned, athletes, people that are, you know, training at a high level, um, whether it's, you know, physically because they are an athlete, or maybe they're just a high performer in general in their business or in their career. And so how does this translate to the work you do with athletes and those high performing people? Um, how important, um, and maybe we can go a little bit deeper into the mindset piece of things, um, when it comes to retraining your brain, um, specifically for like this population of people that consider themselves, you know, I used to be this really high performer and now all of a sudden I have this condition. I have this diagnosis that, you know, is, is a barrier. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think the first thing is whether it's an athlete or not, because I mean, even dealing with athletes with injuries is, is a very similar thing that that fear of getting back to the, the sport to be able to perform at the same level that they were previously. And so, you know, I say, you know, once you have an injury, regardless of what it is, like there's times where people get their wisdom teeth removed or they uh, get a, an ACL repair. Those nerves are basically like kind of shut off in the area because of the trauma. So there's a lot of healing, there's like scar tissue, there's Um, A lot of things that are going on that basically your brain needs time to heal and then learn how to rewire or like reconnect to those muscles or to that area as a way for your body to, again, go back to where it was previously, but it takes time. And so 
we as you know as clinicians we have to introduce the exact and very specific things so the brain can catch on to that quicker because the brain is so plastic i mean um, even going off topic here with like strokes there's a lot of people who have strokes that are paralyzed on one side of the body but then they've had enough brain retraining to reconnect those those signals to those areas that were affected as a way for them to work properly so it's happening in people with strokes and especially in the situation with my sister she can move her arm she can swallow she can walk it's a, it's the same concept when we talk about um those who are trying to understand like how do i get back into the form that i was previously and it's the same fundamentals and it, it's 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 so it's just so interesting because i mean i i've had the chance to work with some really elite level like high elite um uh, athletes and even just going through fundamentals with them they're just non-existent and it's mind-blowing to me like how on earth are you jumping off slopes that are like you know 50 feet up in the air or whatever you want to call it and then they're still able to perform at such a high level but looking at them like you're susceptible for injury and but at that point they're not there yet until it actually happens and so that's where we're the anxiety could come in even from, you know, once you've already had the injury, we have to reconnect. And then not only are we trying to re reconnect the brain to the muscles, but now we have to regulate your autonomic system. And how are you going to tolerate being in a situation where you see that ramp that you have to fly off of? What's your response? How do we manage it? So then we have to go into specific training, whether it's like diaphragmatic breathing, whether it's um, visual tracking, a lot of vestibular, like how can we coordinate the body just to reduce that response when you see it because if we start training and you're still in the same mind state like so that's where again kind of looking at the whole body once you're when when you're confident with things that uh, with spatial awareness and and how things are firing that confidence goes back pretty quick but without having those fundamentals especially with most people like I've worked with some snowboarders where they didn't have really any control of their ankles, but yet they're still flying off these platforms. And even then, like once I expose some of these areas that were weak, they're like, oh my gosh, am I going to hurt myself just from that? And so that's where we do that early on. So they don't have to question that. They're already in that mindset. Like I feel comfortable. I know I can connect. And then they use their natural God given abilities to do whatever they need to from a, you know, from an athletic standpoint. But uh, it's, it does translate over from athlete to chronic illness. And so my treatment does not change. Uh, my approach does not change whether you're chronically ill or, you know, working with athletes. Yeah. And I think something that was interesting that you mentioned is like, you're talking about physical training. Yes. Right. Like phys training the body. Hmm. Um, and then you also mentioned training the brain. And so a lot of people think that this can be very localized, right? Like, oh, I'm training the brain, right? People who work with me maybe think, oh, this is that cognitive approach. And I'm, I'm retraining mental processes in my brain. And maybe people that work with you think, oh, I'm training the body, right? I, I'm training that ankle that was a bit unstable. And I'm working on strengthening it. There's no localization. You know, you're training the body, you're training the brain, you're training the brain, you're training the body, right? It's just such an interesting kind of process. And we, we tend to localize our training to one part of the body. And that's just not how it works, right? That's not how we function as humans is there's this constant communication happening. Mm -hmm. Right. It's and just, it, it's kind of an interesting process. Yeah. And so he, it's funny to mention that too, because that, that's one of the things that more people need education on is understanding how important that is, because there's times even just on a standard injury, we just talked about the ankle, you know, how do you know the ankle issue is coming from the ankle? What if it's an issue in the neck that again, kind of going into compensation that's causing your body to protect itself by over moving certain areas that are causing more strain. And so that's where kind of like the outside the box thinking is that you really do have to look at the whole body because when we look at even sections of the spine that are responsible for either parasympathetic or sympathetic responses, where is that leaving you from the response to actual structural issues? Are you finding structural issues in the same area where you're having too much sympathetic response? And then that correlates into 
how you build a plan and how you build a program based on what your body is like e- expressing, you know, externally. Um, and that's actually one of the things that people don't uh, or haven't re- fully understood as to what we're doing is that a lot of stuff that we've done, um, and I'm sure there might be other uh, providers, but linking specific movements with specific areas that are in separate parts of the autonomic nervous system. Um, and that, it, I feel like that as well has been a big part of people having a greater understanding of themselves. Of, yeah, it really is a mind-body connection. I really do have to correlate all this together for my body to, to move soundly. Right. Yeah. It's so important. It is constant communication that's happening. And I know you and I have talked about this previously, people who may be afraid of retraining their brain, right? That's what, you know, we're doing here is we're retraining a lot of these neural pathways in the brain so that we can improve the communication between your brain and body so the physical body can perform. So for those people who may be afraid to do this, what is the first step someone can take today if they're not sure if they want to do it, if they're not sure if this is for them, they're a bit intimidated by that concept of brain retraining? What's something that they can do today to kind of start that process of of healing and improve that communication? Well, I think the first part is disassociating psychological or mental health problems with brain retraining. It's because you're doing brain retraining, it doesn't mean you have any like major psychological issues. Um, And I think that's the fear is that people, you know, especially in a world where they've been told, you know, your symptoms are, you know, psychological, you know, you have, you may have mental health problems. They're now associating anything that involves brain retraining as, as, well, I don't need that. I don't have any mental health problems. I'm not, this is real pain. It is real pain and and there is trauma to it. So if you're working on things that need physical help, if your brain is not responding the way it needs to, it is going to affect your physical ability to recover. So I've had patients where we've been able to change a lot of biomechanical faults and and improve strength, but we've been limited because their brain just wasn't sending the correct signals because there was such a heightened stress response. There was uh, a lot of other things that were going on that had they had more brain retraining, I, I, I personally think things would have been different because I've seen it to where when people combine both, their outcomes are a lot greater because now they're aware of certain responses that their body is doing in addition to um, how that brain is going to work to help connect to the rest of the body. So I think I think that should honestly be every person's starting point um, because I think it's a good foundation um, it's a good foundation to what you're going to encounter because that the physical component is a longer journey, but the, the brain retraining part is, I feel like much faster and on, on the, when you compare to how long physiologically it takes to get like, you know, functional strength and and those kind of things. But I, I think, I think it's probably one of the most vital things and you find it now people nowadays, they are doing a lot of like self care. They do meditation. They do, uh, a lot of mental wellness. It's like going to get a massage like once a month. You should be doing the same type of mental like brain health as you would a massage. And I I think there's not, it's not educated enough to people. Um, but hopefully at some point, everyone will start kind of really uh, valuing the, you know, what brain health really is about. Yeah, well said, Jonathan. I think there's such a massive opportunity <laughs> For education in this in this space and like you said kind of delinking that stigma of what many people think of when they think of mental health but when we when we say brain health in this context right it's it, it's obviously it's linked um but we mean it in this in this very different way than i think a lot of people um receive it when they when they mm-hmm. first think of that so i'm curious You obviously have met people from all over the world. You've worked with, you know, hundreds, thousands of clients um, who are now subscribing to your method of physical Mm -hmm. therapy. And you mentioned earlier, I love what you said in terms of, I find that some of the best practitioners that have the most innovative approaches are the ones where people have to go through a lot of layers of practitioners, of approaches, Mm -hmm. 
um, of trials and errors, errors and tribulations before they get to people like you. Um, and so I'm curious, do you have any simple exercises or tools that you can give to our listeners today that they can use or do at home to really practice injury prevention, right? From that more proactive preventative lens. Yeah. Um, so I say as far as specific exercises, um, that's, it's a little tricky just because again, everything is so individualized and we really do focus on that because I've done certain foundational things for certain people that just did not work for others. And so we, I, let's just say we have a bag of tricks on, on what it, are good starting points. But what I, I say is really good for everyone is the breathing. Um, I think diaphragmatic breathing is, is, is probably one of the best things that you can do one, you know, because of the blood flow and reducing anxiety. But a lot of people don't understand that the diaphragm, its location, and, and it actually has ligament attachments to like, you know, the liver, or the heart. So there's a lot of other things uh, internally that that diaphragm is is, is really valuable for. Uh, in addition to uh, even gut health, getting information to the gut. Um, so I feel like, you know, everything re re revolves around the gut area anyways. And so when you think about its communication to the brain, just a simple thing of learning diaphragmatic breathing of, you know, being able to breathe in through your nose and, you know, expand the belly and breathing out while um, your, your belly comes back to neutral. Like we, we have like a 10 part breathing series that people have to master. And they're like, well, I didn't realize it was this challenging to breathe on my back or breathe in sitting or breathe in standing with my arms over my head. And it, we don't think about those things. So I, I think in general, just for sympathetic or just autonomic regulation, breathing is probably the, one of the things that I would recommend just people just learning. Yeah. Just learning. <laughs> My it's just my brain is going to so many different directions of all the breathing like uh, progressions that it's it's that's that's the number one that's the number one totally and I I think breathing I mean that's a that's a great example because I always think of breathing as a physiological function that we do have control over and a lot of times we don't have that control over physiological functions, mm -hmm. direct control, yeah. excuse me, mm -hmm. right? We have a lot of indirect control. Um, so breathing is one of those like quick go-tos of like, okay, now we can, you know, begin to regulate our heart rate, our, our respiration rate. We can, you know, stimulate the vagus nerve. So many things kind of tied up in, in breathing mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so something, Jonathan, that I think, you know, a lot of people are taking away today is you don't have to live with the diagnosis and the prognosis that some practitioner along the line gave you just because they gave it to you. Right. And if you started to kind of think about that diagnosis from a little bit of a different perspective, looking at it from this perspective of, okay, a miscommunication happening between the brain and the body. And if you started to kind of think about your diagnosis from that perspective, what is possible for me to start to regulate that communication, learn to regulate the nervous system and then see changes to my physical body. And for me, that was a huge takeaway. Is there anything else you want to leave our audience with today? Any kind of words of wisdom or any kind of key takeaway points for them? Yeah, I, I think that based on what you said too, like you, each, every person has more control than what they think. The, the diagnosis doesn't take away your control. You're, I mean, everything is in your hands. So how you view things, what approach you decide to take. Um, I think those are all really, really important that regardless of what that title is, you do have control to a certain extent, right? Um, and you can make some good changes, some positive changes in the direction that you would like for, you know, whatever future you have, uh, aspirations, your goals. Uh, there's a lot that you really can do. And I think you have to understand the brain is really powerful. Um, you know, you watch documentaries all the time of people going from, you know, I hate to say it, like almost a vegetative state to being able to walk and talk to people. 
And I know that's not every case, but you have to believe that the brain is that powerful um, and have that hope as a way for you to, you know, to move forward with your life. Because I think when you don't have that, it makes it very, very challenging to get stuck in a rut. Um, and even if that involves, you know, getting around good people, get a good support system, then none of this is meant to be done by yourself. And, you know, even if you're a provider or practitioner, I mean, getting with someone that you really trust and has your best interests is also important because we are part of the journey as well. Um, but really, I think surrounding yourself with really good people and understanding that it's okay, you're going to have days where you just like, you're going to associate with the diagnosis and it's going to drop you. But the next day you pick back up and you got to do something else to change it. And I think having that motivation and using the the term no excuses um, really does help because I mean, you're, you're only going as far as where you feel like you can take yourself, um, given your resources and everything else. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I want to mention one thing here quickly, Jonathan. I know, you know, a couple of years ago, I hadn't worked with people with a diagnosis of EDS. And the first person I did work with, um, she reached out to me, I think it was last year. And she said, just so you know, brain retraining works. My symptoms are gone. <laughs> This stuff really works. And I just thought, like, I was just so amazed by that to hear that because a lot of times, you know, we work with these chronic conditions and you just don't know how much is possible, right? How powerful the brain is. And then to see that happen of like regulating the autonomic nervous system really like sh can shift those symptoms. And so that was really incredible to, to see and hear. And I know, you know, a lot of your patients that you work with are so mm -hmm. thankful for the the tools you give them because they do see massive shifts in their lives. Oh, yes, we are powerful beings and we do have the ability to heal ourselves and to transform. And Jonathan, I loved what you said about community and just the power of it to really support that journey and that process. So thank you so much for being here with us today. I know I have personally learned so much from you. So excited to have you in my community now. Um, and so for those of you listening, you can find Jonathan on Instagram at par backslash, excuse me. Okay, I'm gonna start that over. For those of you listening, you can find Jonathan on Instagram at par underscore PT. That's P-A-R-R -R underscore PT and on his website where you can find more on his three systems approach. And his website is linked below in the show notes. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you again next week.